Hi everyone, we're gonna wait just about two minutes to get started, just let everyone join the room uh, and then we'll get going. So thanks for joining us. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started now. Welcome everyone. I'm Tom Walker. I'm the Executive Director at Encore Outpatient Services. We are a partnership between Care and Treatment Centers and Maryland Addiction Recovery Center. Thank you for joining us for our series, DMV Neighbors and Treatment in Recovery, a spotlight on local resources, programs, and expertise. Every week we look forward to highlighting a different provider in the DMV region to provide you with some insights and resources you can utilize in your practice to help you adapt to the changes we've all had to adjust to in the wake of COVID-19 pan pandemic. Um, please note that these sessions are not eligible for continuing education credit. We will be conducting these sessions in a webinar format. All participant microphones will be muted. <clears throat> Excuse me. And during the presentation, please do utilize the Q&A feature to ask any questions you may have. We will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. This week's scheduled presenter, Vanessa Terry, was unable to be with us today due to a family emergency. So we're very, very grateful to have two fantastic speakers with us today to speak on the topic of students in recovery and collegiate re success. Sarah McDonald is the Collegiate Recovery Specialist at Maryland Addiction Recovery Center, where she works with patients to assess their readiness to re-engage in their education, facilitates weekly meetings, and provides academic counseling. Jonathan Salzberg is the Executive Director of Collegiate Recovery Services at Karen. In this role, he works with clients to examine what success in recovery means and how to strategically realign their career and recovery goals to enhance their overall quality of life. Sarah and Jonathan have worked closely together in implementing Karen's Collegiate Success Program, a proven collegiate program for patients to begin to continue their college education during treatment and recovery. Please welcome Sarah and Jonathan. The floor is yours. John, I think you're still muted. Unmute. I think I'm unmuted. Okay, oh. good, good. All right. Can everyone hear me? <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Tom, and uh, thank you. Uh, really grateful to be here today and to be with my colleague Sarah McDonald. And uh, next week we have uh, another colleague, Eric Quinlan, who's going to be presenting on a, kind of a follow-up. Uh, subject about how we're dealing academically uh, in this environment, um, in the COVID pandemic, and how we're helping students with the learning experience. So today we're going to talk about the Therapeutic Alliance, uh, collegiate recovery, what a Therapeutic Alliance is, and kind of what, what, what we're doing on um, uh, Karen and Mark uh, and Encore uh, to help more students access higher education and care. A little bit about myself, because I do like talking about myself, I'm just kidding. Um, but one of the things that, that I want to share about is I had the opportunity in my background to work at the uh, uh, Warden School of Business, uh, University of Pennsylvania as a graduate assistant in admissions, a little bit of my background. And I also had the opportunity to work at Florida Atlantic University, which is part of the State University System of Florida in admissions. And uh, 
you know, there really had an opportunity to look at how college admissions plays into the whole um, enrollment process and really the importance of recruitment, the importance of identifying best fit candidates, the importance of really uh, helping students to advocate for themselves. And, and, and that can lead into, you know, kind of the role that I have now is my passion and love is helping students in recovery advocate for themselves and be able to gain admission to universities and be able to be part of and leaders in these collegiate recovery programs. Um, so that, that's a little bit more about me. And I like to just let Sarah McDonald make a little quick introduction as well. Hi, everybody. My name is Sarah McDonald. Um, my title here at Mark is Collegiate Recovery Specialist. We've had the Karen College Success Program here at Mark for a little over a year now. And I was really excited when I was offered the opportunity to start this program at Mark. Um, mostly because I myself am a student in recovery. Um, I've been sober for a little over eight years. And when, after I got sober, I decided to go back to school for chemical dependency counseling. Um, I got my AA from a local community college. And now I'm at Towson University working on my bachelor's in psychology. Um, all of this really helps to like inform my time with the students. Um, I have a really unique lens coming from my own experience and I try really hard to bring that to my work with each of them. Um, so thank you, I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you for that. So we're gonna start with the first slide. I'm gonna kind of have to uh, give a, all right, excellent. So if you think about it, you know, 10 years ago, I had the greatest opportunity in my life, right? Uh, to follow my passion and love, which is helping students in recovery and launching the college success program at Karen. And one of the things that, you know, what happened was well, when I worked in admissions was I get a lot of calls from high school counselors, like a high school would call and they would say, you know what, Jonathan, I have this great student. Uh, she or he or she are doing, is doing so well, and I just really want to advocate for them. I want to write a letter of recommendation for them. I know that they're, uh, they're on the cusp, and they may not meet all criteria or they're in the range, but I really want you to see and hear how great of a student this is as evidenced by it. And if you think about that, that what I just said is, you know, high school counselors, high schools have college counselors that call and advocate on behalf of their students, right? Uh, admissions offices uh, are able to take those calls and listen and hear and, and speak and, and try to determine who's their best fit students. Why shouldn't treatment centers have college counselors that are helping advocating and trying to help and guide their students, their patients while they're in treatment to find the right school or to say, hey, listen, I have a great student for you. Obviously, you know, FERPA and HIPAA laws uh, abiding by, but um, you know, so the idea really thought like, you know, if you think about it, treatment centers throughout the country creating best practices to be able to implement a, having a college counselor in a treatment framework just was very fascinating. And, and in 2010, we launched this program of College Assess at, at, at Karen Renaissance, which really was based on the premise of, you know, how can we best advocate for our students that are looking at schools, that are returning to schools, that are trying to apply to schools that have support services? How can we best advocate for themselves, just like a uh, college counselor at a high school? Um, so kind of that was the origins of it. And um, you know, part of that, when we tell the, the label Therapeutic Alliance, is that communication that we need to have with a university partner. And the fact that the university partner needs to be recovery informed and understand that recovery, someone who is in recovery, who's going through and doing the personal work is gaining that self-awareness that is really, really making them an asset to that college and that to uh, that university. So um, that's a little bit about the kind of the, the, the idea and the origins of this. Um, if we may, we can move it to the next slide. So, um, you know, if we think about what we're going to be talking about today and learning objectives is kind of what I was just saying is talking about the, the value of, uh, of a therapy alliance between a college, a university, and, and the treatment center, right? What does that look like? If you think about a therapeutic alliance with the client is building that rapport, building that communication, and creating a safe environment, and assuming with the client's permission and, uh, you know, with the proper releases, that we're able to build that rapport and that communication with not only their therapists that they're coming from, but also the university that they're going to or that they're coming from, 
um, so that we can work with the best fit people to make sure that that's a smooth transition back to the university and that we're all speaking and communicating. Uh, so that's kind of what we mean in talking about, you know, uh, help you inform you on what we're doing with our university uh, colleagues to be able to support that transition, which naturally plays into the collegiate recovery framework. The third piece, the second piece that we're going to talk a little bit about today and have a conversation, hopefully, uh, is about, you know, if you think about it, there is a lot of clinical value from speaking with my clinical colleagues in having people attend college or attend school while they're in treatment, when clinically appropriate, right? Um, that's not, I'm not a clinician, I don't know when that is, but working with the clinical team and the family and the patient and the university in some cases to determine, you know, is it appropriate for someone to start doing school while they're in treatment so they can experience the pressures and the triggers and deal with it in a clinical environment. And we're going to talk about a little bit what we've learned about that as well. And the third piece is, you know, helping you know, this is a true passion um, is really helping, you know, to talk about what we can do and what we can do with our university par partners and collegiate recovery programs to get the college of the office of admissions this, um, to really look at university to look at their these students as assets and talk, you know, build it, you know, one of my favorite movies is uh, field of dreams and in field of dreams, the movie, uh, if, for those who haven't seen it, I might give it away is build it and they will come. You know, so the idea was building a baseball field and more people will come, et cetera. Um, it's one of my favorite movies. And, you know, with collegiate recovery programs and building these collegiate recovery programs where they have on-campus sports service, recovery housing, all these incredible things that um, are going on. I think that, that that's great, but we got to get students into these colleges and the students uh, need to, the Office of Admissions need to be aware of the fact that they need these students at the college to help the college campus and they will be assets of the college. So we'll talk about that a little bit more today, if we may. Move forward with the next slide. So I'm gonna let Sarah uh, McDonald jump in here. Yeah, so we all know that substance use disorders are really, really common among college age students. Um, it is a problem nationwide among, across any university campus. Um, what we don't usually think about is the fears that families have when trying to, so they, the families recognize that like, okay, my son or daughter may have a substance use disorder, but we don't want to put them in treatment yet. Um, we hear all the time that families are prioritizing education over clinical and clinical care and recovery. Um, if you want to move to the next slide, Caitlin, that would be cool. Yeah, so these are these are some of the most common excuses really that we hear for why parents aren't saying this is an emergency. We need to get them into treatment right now. Um, they're worried that their students won't be able to go back to school. They're worried that they'll fail. They're worried that they will not graduate, that they won't make it back. Um, but some of the things that the College Success Program has been able to help with is helping parents navigate that, really intervening early like upon admissions, we get families that call and say, my son or daughter is in the middle of a semester, how can you help them? And that's where Jonathan and I step in and his team down in Karen. We can help arrange mid-semester medical withdrawals. We can help arrange incompletes so they can finish their classes after they get stabilized. Um, and at Mark, I have been able to help students finish out the semester with amazing support from professors who have said, okay, this kid needs a chance, and they've allowed the student to take final exams at Mark proctored by me, um, which is really, really lucky that we had some professors that recognized the emergency of this. Um, Jonathan, do you have any that you want to elaborate on more? Yeah, absolutely. Um you know, my, one of my mentors when I first um, started at Karen would say, listen, Jonathan, I, need, I, I really suggest that you sit in on these calls and speak with these families uh, before they come, be, and speak with these families and patients before they come here to really hear the issues and challenges that they're dealing with. And I sat on for phone calls um, with our, they're called case specialists or our admissions team that determine whether or not uh, these 
candidates are a good fit for for Karen or where 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 would be a good fit for them. For the, um, and one of the things that kind of one of the things that really stuck out and affects me to this day is uh, when a family called and said that their daughter um, had uh, had completed midterm exams and that she was in the midst of her addiction, really, 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 uh, really intense. And uh, it was November, October, it was late October or early November at the time of the call. And would we have a, a bed available? Would there be space available in December once she's done with finals? And, um, you know, and it really struck me because, um, you know, that they were hoping to get the semester done with and then that transition to, to college, back, back to, to treatment. And then, you know, how important the, the idea was finishing the semester, how important it was financially, how important it was for her to feel like she's completed something. And, um, you know, it really, it really was incredible to have an opportunity to educate them about the, the policies at the university, whether or not she could get incompletes, how, you know, we could really connect her with, with, with people at the universities that might be able to advocate. I know that's, you know, that's a story that is more common than I would like it to be. Um, and to be able to have a university partner, I'll just throw out some names, a, uh, a Dean of Students at Georgia Tech to be able to email the Dean of Students, not having the person's name, not having any of the contact information, not violating any HIPAA or, or FRIPA, and just asking if the Dean, is, you know, would the Dean advocate for a kind of, for a student to be able to get these in place to make sure that their transcripts not, uh, 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 is not uh, sacrificed for their health. I think is a huge piece and for these families to be able to know that they don't have to make that decision and choice between the two. Um, so that that's kind of a, a case study that I like to share. Another, another case I like to share is that um, there was a student that came to treatment and, uh, and literally the therapist said to me, Jonathan, if this student goes back to school, he's going to die. To die. He's drinking, he's using to this extent. And uh, the family, uh, was really bought into the student going back to school, but there was there was hope that maybe if um, if we could get him to still be able to take classes down here at FAU, he could still you know maybe buy a little bit more time and IOP and still kind of maybe don't leave before the miracle happens. Um, and it was really remarkable, you know, working with 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 the family, working with the student, we were able to get it so that he could finish his last semester at Florida Atlantic University and still graduate from his original university. So just things like that, that aren't rocket science, but really take a lot of advocacy to get upper level courses approved through the university, to get the original university to approve it, to waive residency rule requirements. There's a lot of different things that, you know, takes a village, right? So, um, you know, the, but 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 it, get, it gives us more time to, to support the client. So, um, but all that rests, on a few things, one of which is the university, the alliance with the university partners, with the people at the university that are willing to understand and advocate for these students to say, oh, we're not making excuses here. They're advocating for themselves. So that was a really long two cases, but still stick to me to this day. Um, we can move on to the next slide. So this is what I always say. Don't leave, don't leave before the miracle happens, right? Um, there, it's a saying that's in a lot of programs, uh, and, and you know the, what it means to me is that you know it take, time takes time, right? And I know that's easier said than done, but you know if the research and the data shows that, um, and this slide speaks to, is that the longer that someone's in a recovery-oriented system of care, the longer that they're in a, a, a extended care or a, some structure or continued care services that includes collegiate recovery programming, uh, the better the outcomes, right? So when I talk about, you know, extending the, the continuum, and I'm when, I meet, when I talk about that, I mean that partnering with collegiate recovery programs um, and, uh, and helping support our students that have come to us to tap into these programs, whether it's at Rutgers University, Towson University, whatever it may be, is really, really based on the data, right? The empirical evidence that shows that this will lead to greater outcomes, you know? So uh, I, I really, I, I always include this quote of uh, this quote that, you know, the, some of this data from the National Drug Control Strategy that, um, and this, is, you know, research shows that treatment is most effective when it addresses addiction as a chronic condition, retiring, re requiring continued services and support structures over an extended period of time. So, 
if someone's leaving treatment and they don't have that aftercare plan that includes support structures, I think we're, I think we're doing a, a, a disservice. So if we can continue. I'm gonna turn over to Sarah about collegiate recovery. Yeah. So collegiate recovery is a growing initiative. Um, I think it's over a hundred universities that have collegiate recovery programs to some capacity on campus. Those obviously range in services that are offered. Some collegiate recovery programs have sober dorms. Some do extensive sober activities. Some take more of a clinical therapeutic approach and do counseling and group therapy. Um, some require abstinence and some don't. So part of our job is to know what is offered at the different collegiate recovery programs when we're making, rec when we're making recommendations. And something that's really cool that's reflected in this slide is how students stay at universities when they're engaged in collegiate recovery programs. Their GPAs are better. They have a higher chance of graduating. I know the Mark spring semester, we had an average of like 3.85 or something with our students, which is amazing. Um, those students had like 2.0s and below before getting sober. Um, it really speaks to the strength and capabilities of people in recovery. Um, and I think that's something that colleges are starting to see, you know, we, people used to see the stigma and the weakness of people in addiction, but that weakness is like counteracted with this amazing, amazing strength of people in recovery. Um, and part of what I like to do is encourage the students that I work with to use that as an asset. You know, they can speak to that. They can write their college essays about how they've grown in recovery, what values they have um, brought into their soul, you know? Um, and really, yeah, I don't know. Um, they're, they're a great thing. Um, something that is hard for students in recovery is there's a lot of wreckage, you know, speaking for myself, I started school when I was 18 years old. I was struggled with substance use, depression, anxiety, and my GPA shows that. Um, I started at Towson 12 years ago. My GPA is terrible and I'm now back at Towson University. Um, and I had an amazing first semester back. Spring 2020 was my first semester back in the middle of COVID. It was not ideal, but I did it. I got a 3.85 myself. Um, and then last, Yay. yes, so exciting. Last week, I got this email from the student services saying that I was at risk of being suspended from Towson. Uh, clearly, my GPA just flagged something in this system, but the email that I got was terrifying. It was saying, if you don't take these steps by this time, you're not going to be able to continue with your education. And I just, my heart sinks when I see that, you know, obviously it brings up so much shame in myself because I'm not that person, but the students that we work with don't have, like I've been in, I've been in recovery for a long time. The students that I work with don't have that. They don't have the insight and the awareness to say, I'm not that person anymore. And they can get stuck saying, I'm never gonna be able to do this. They don't have the skills to respond to that email, to advocate for themselves, to reach out to the Towson Collegiate Recovery person and say, Zach Hitchens, and say, how can you help me with this? Um, I am really lucky that I can do that for myself and advocate. I also used my time with Jonathan to get some additional support. Um, but the schools, we just, we have to show them how important it is for them to identify students in recovery and to speak amongst themselves. Caitlin, I don't know if you wanna, if we can move to the next slide, um, but these departments, the admission, the Dean of Students, the counseling centers, they're so, siloed. They don't talk to each other. They don't know. These big state universities, you, they, they don't even know what staff they could find in each of these departments. Um, and 
Jonathan and I would like to say that it's it's their job, you know, these collegiate recovery staff need to know who they can reach out to in admissions, in dean of, in the student affairs, all of these, um, to communicate amongst each other. And yeah, I don't know. It's and part of that's part, part of that has been being empowered. Our collegiate recovery staff sometimes that they, they're they they have incredible if I may jump in incredible yeah. roles and responsibilities, and that the, the it's it's funded positions which is great, but they're not able to have the power or be able to be perceived or because of stigma perhaps that's just our experience you know, uh, from the other departments they're they're not really able to kind of help and ne negotiate as much as 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 it could be in, in our opinion and what we mean by that is really that's where more and greater uh information and advocacy could be done perhaps with other departments so that they're informed recovery informed and that's no i mean there's limited resources there's limited resources these universities are facing limited resources limited resources limited resources declining enrollment with, with the pandemic particularly. So, you know, there's not enough time for all of this, but at the same time, um, you know, I just, I, I, say, I agree, I just wanna share what Sarah was saying is it's just a very, very challenging situation when departments aren't speaking to each other and other departments may not perceive that department as being to their level per se. And that's just our speculation. Sarah, please. No, I think, yeah. I don't, Jonathan, do you want to move on to the next slide? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, this is kind of what we're talking, a systems approach, therapeutic alliance. Let's, let's first talk about what a collegiate recovery program is, right? So we're using the word collegiate recovery. What does that mean? Um, kind of how do I view it in my, 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 in my mind? Um, and, and the way I, I view a collegiate recovery program, collegiate recovery, uh, which is a campus-based program, campus-based recovery program is, I kind of think of it from an academic uh, standpoint in the sense of um, when, I, when I went to college, which is a long time ago, um, there was, you know, my, I remember my, my mother, uh, who's awesome, which wanted me to be part of this living learning community. It's called LLC, a living learning communities, which are still very, very big to this day. And the idea behind these living learning communities um, was, you know, I went to this really big school, right? And the idea was to take people in the same major, have them live near each other, have them uh, have classes, in the, be in these big classes together. So these 20 people would have all their classes together. They'd be able to have a study hall together. They'd be able to uh, have, um, they, every week they would be able to have a, a weekly meeting that was run by a professional, just additional support services to make a big school, school feel like a small school and have that cohort of professionals. So it was very effective for me and the research and data shows it's extremely effective in general, right? So you saw a higher retention and graduation rate. So this cohort model was really, uh, was, uh, is kind of a same, similar model that I think of when I think of collegiate recovery programs where I think of a cohort of like-minded individuals working together on a daily basis to stay sober, to stay from alcohol and drugs and to basically contribute their talent and time to, to help others. And, uh, you know, that's kind of what I put together. The, the Association of Recovery and Higher Education, which is ARHE, has incredible definitions on what that looks like, uh, what a campus-based collegiate recovery program looks like. They also have a data and breakdown of what are best practice collegiate recovery programs. So, uh, but that's kind of for, from when I, when I present on what I see a collegiate recovery program being and, and, and that's kind of what, what I share. So when I talk about a systems approach to supporting the patient's transition to college, you know, we talk about how treatment is so much more effective when we're helping the family and the patient, right? So if we're just helping the patient get better and we're not trying to help the family, educate the family on, 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 on enabling and, and, and what areas they may or may not be doing that could help and contribute positively to the recovery, you know, we, we need to be doing that. So the idea of a systems approach is um, why shouldn't we include in that conversation the university partner, the academic advisor? Why shouldn't we include the person at the college or university that could help best support um, Lauren or Joey going back to college, right? So really, as part of the treatment process, ideally, we would like to encourage 
our clients and our patients to consider signing a release for their academic advisor or their champion at the university who really has been their contact. Um, if they're coming from a collegiate recovery program, uh, we definitely want them to sign a release for, a, uh, for their collegiate recovery advisor and really work with everyone to say, hey, these are, you know, these are how we can remove barriers to accessing services when they get to campus. And maybe that instead of doing five classes, they do four classes. Maybe uh, instead of taking big classes, they take small classes so they get, they'll get lost. But working with everyone to really integrate an educational plan that's consistent with their treatment plan. So we'll continue to our next slide. So I talked about what communication looks like. So this is kind of out there, right? In a good way, like actually encouraging our clients and patients to disclose, right? In a sense, you could say we're not, not mandating, but encouraging if they, and talking about it. And also there's a stigma, right? So let's have a conversation about this, you know, talk about it. I, I, I think it's, you know, a few different things. Let's say for the student that's applying to college, right? The narrative of going through the adversity that they've gone through and presenting themselves as a position of strength, presenting their recovery and what they've gone through. So really talking to the clients about the buy-in, the fact that, you know, um, the fact that by being able to, you know, talk to your professors, your advisor about what you're going through, they can better advise you. You don't have to give all the details, but an example would be if you're in the middle of a semester, and all of a sudden you don't show up because you're in treatment, right? The most schools, if you don't take a medical leave, if you're trying to get the incomplete status, most schools that I have experience with, you have to get the, um, each incomplete has to go through the, the professor's discretion. So the professor makes that decision. The professor, the professor will make the sole discretion of whether he or she will give you a, uh, a, uh, a incomplete. So with that, you know, we have to ask ourselves deep questions of what do I share with the professor? Unfortunately, in a lot of different, and certainly when I went to school and certainly to this day, there's a lot of students that aren't as honest. So professors are, might be a little bit professionally skeptical. So do you provide medical documentation? Do you provide a verification as evidenced by the fact that I'm here and I've copied so-and-so in this email to advocate for this incomplete? So talking to these clients about why it might benefit them to sign a release, why it might benefit them to uh, sign a FERPA, as well as a release of information um, so that we can be able to communicate and advocate and verify without giving away too much that you are in fact doing the, what you need to do within the proper context of the law. Um, another piece of communication is very, very challenging for us. And I like to see more, you know, I think that Knowing who the right contact is at the university is some of the most challenging aspects, right? So, and there's so many different circumstances of such, which could be, you know, in a situation like the incompletes, hey, if we had an academic advisor or a collegiate recovery person that was able to advocate and be able to have that ability, great, we could just go through one person, right, who could advocate for all that. But in some cases, you have to advocate to each of the professors and each of the, some of the professors don't trust it. So we have to have releases signed for all the professors. So, uh, or we'd ask and suggest that, um, uh, you know, who is the best fit? Who is the champion at the university? And it has a lot to do with what the silos look like and how, how you know, I was very, very pleased when I saw an increase in a lot of this case management services at universities throughout the country, where there's case managers that really all they focus on is transitioning and supporting and helping the student get back to the campus to put everything in place. So, um, so again, the release is signed, helping them navigate who's the best contact. Um, and really, what does the educational plan look like going back to school? That's their academic advisor's job, but how does that support their recovery? I want to throw in one, one challenge why I just said that. So I had a student where we didn't have releases signed. The student did not want to sign releases, right? and that, that's their prerogative. Um, and they went to, uh, they were getting ready for school, and they met with their academic advisor, and they signed up for, um, for three classes, I believe it was two to three classes and um, their academic advisor, you know, didn't know, just said, listen, based on what you're reporting, you want to graduate sooner. So why would you only take two to three classes? You should be taking five classes. You should be taking four to five classes. You should recognize that you're going to be behind the curve if you don't. And the academic advisor was, was, was had the right intentions of she, she, he or she was hearing that, you know, 
the student wants to graduate, is excited, all that stuff. But really, it was the clinical recommendation. The student and the family really bought into the recommendation. Like, let's focus on your recovery first. Let's focus on going to groups, individual groups. Let's focus on this. Definitely do school, but school, you know, there's a gray area. You can do school with two or three classes and still be engaged in your recovery and do all, you know, balance it. And I think it was a lot of work for us to undo that uh, and to ensure that everyone understood why we were making that recommendation and, you know, having a conversation with the advisor might have been helpful. So that's kind of just one, one example of, you know, not all of us on the same page allows us not to undo incredible work that this, this person may or may not have done. So we're going to go to the, uh, to the next piece. So, you know, we talked for a while, um, but this is this piece is really a call to action. This 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 this, this slide and uh, really, if you're a university and a college, um, and you work in a counseling center or you work at a counseling center or university, you know, over the past ten to fifteen years, rightfully so, I, I think that that you know you hear stories, horrible stories of uh, of uh, bad player bad players in the treatment industry, calling universities, cold calling university counseling centers, and uh, trying to get referrals or trying to get this and trying to get that. And, uh, you know, um, I want to ask, I, I really, I want to encourage you if you're a university, uh, if you're a university or have contacts with the university, really encourage them to look out to see who are best practice treatment centers. And, um, you know, and also in the sense of who could you work with? So, so what I'm getting at is, when Sarah and I do a lot of calls with universities to try to introduce ourselves. Um, and what I mean by that is calling a university counseling center to learn about support services on campus. We tend to get sometimes um, the, the, the answer, why are you calling? Are you, um, you know, or do you want to speak to our referral coordinator? Why are you, just as more of like, I, I, I feel, or I experience is, you know, kind of, um, you know, more of the, we're calling from a business standpoint when in fact we're calling usually because we have a student or our students that are looking to transition back to there so really welcoming that call and encouraging treatment providers to work with you is a really really important piece so i would say to our university colleagues look at your who your local treatment who are your local best practice treatment centers and who would be um who treat young adults or treat adults uh, that would be a good partner for you um, if you're a treatment center and looking to create a continuum of care and looking, you know, really, I, I think you really looking at how you can support your local college and universities and developing collegiate recovery programs, supporting them, um, reaching out, identifying uh, community college, whatever that looks like, but really putting on part of your outreach and part of your uh, budget is to really help support your local, local community. Cause at, again, recovery, uh, you know, recovery, if you're going to, you know, Karen, we're recovery for life, right? So we need to invest time and resources in ensuring that when our patients are leaving here, they're able to tap into the right resources. So um, I would encourage other facilities like Mark that's already doing it, how they can partner and, and col uh, collaborate with, uh, with universities um, and vice versa. So I'll let Sarah kind of continue on that as well. Yeah, so here at mark we've been able to really connect with obviously towson universities right around the corner um i've started to develop a really good relationship with zach hitchens and um, emily from the counseling and recovery center and a lot of the mark patients are good fit for community college um so jonathan's helped me really identify staff in the advising department and staff in the admissions team who are willing to communicate with me so I can help advocate for our students and they know about the releases. They help me get the FERPA signed and they help point me in the right direction. Um, so I've been really lucky with that to find people who are willing to kind of go above and beyond to help our students get back um, on the right track. Thank you. Thank you very much about that. Um, you know, I was thinking about more and more, you know, you have Encore that's near Nova, which is a, you know, the local community college for Virginia. Um, 
you know, there's some community colleges are so important. About 10, 10, 12 years ago, it was incredible that they got more funding to create a lot of the community colleges were able to do state college where you could actually get a four year degree. So, and the incredible thing, like for instance, like Maryland, Pennsylvania, um, Florida, there's articulation agreements between community colleges and universities where um, if you, you know, are real second chance programs, if you think about it, if you have not done as well, that you're able to get a guaranteed acceptance to one of the 11 state universities. And, you know, just there's so many different things that we can help present to the student to show that there's hope. This is all about giving, this is all, in my opinion, this is again, part of an intervention model, which is giving hope to say, hey, there's a better way out there. And you have a lot of hope. There's a lot of hope. You can get back your education. I, you know, a lot of the things we, we didn't talk about was technical school and other things, but um, just, just a lot of great opportunities. And I think that if you're looking, if you're a treatment center on this, on this or an outpatient center or someone council looking, you know, I really recommend programs like this that are just incredible and creating an infrastructure of support for that um, and having a designated staff for that. Um, if you're universities, again, I'm going to encourage, again, looking at uh, treatment centers um, to, and local providers to look at how you can support a smooth transition. Um, if you're therapists or private practice clinicians, looking at, you know, really how, um, you know, keeping, you know, looking at the Association of Recovery and Higher Education, ARAG, which is having a conference next week um, with Re Association Recovery Schools and learning about what's going on on that front. So getting clients excited about the future um, and certainly always feel free to reach out to Sarah and I about any questions. But again, this is, this is, uh, this is a very exciting time, very scary, but very exciting time that we're seeing. You know, when I started 10 years ago, there were about you know 20 to 25 collegiate recovery programs, and now there's over 120 collegiate recovery efforts throughout the country. So there's there's and there's more that we need to do. There's this is just a start. So um, anyway, I just want to thank everyone for allowing us here. I know we kind of ended up ending a little bit early. So uh, again, uh, next week, uh, my colleague Eric Quinlan will really be speaking about um, with this COVID pandemic. Uh, how he's working uh, with students, he's a master's in teaching, and how to help with their learning experience uh, for those in recovery and not able to be on a college campus right now, so, or academic campus, so thank you. Thank you. So, so we'll move into some uh, questions and answers for the next little bit. Um, you know, I, you, you, I was texting Mallory, you two, and, and, um, from Maryland Addiction Recovery Center and saying that um, y'all are doing such a great job because every question I have, you, you answer it, right? It's one of those presentations where it's like, what about this? And then you jump into the solution. So thank you for that. What, I know personally, when I first started getting some exposure to collegiate recovery and ARHE and going to the conferences, um, the demographics weren't what I expected. Um, they were just different than what I had in my head. Can you talk about the demographics of folks in recovery that are, you know, engaged in in collegiate recovery that you're working with, um, ages, backgrounds, kind of what you're seeing, you know, the most of, and what we need to, you know, see more of. Sarah, you want to start? Yeah. So most of the students that I work with are between the ages of 18 and I would say 24. Is most of them. Um, I have some that are later 20s who are interested in wrapping up um, bachelor's degrees, some going back for graduate degrees. Um, unfortunately, most of them are white Caucasians, which is, it needs to be addressed in the collegiate recovery world that um, uh, people of color are underrepresented in recovery programs across the country. Um, I, last year at the ARHE conference, that was something that was addressed in almost every single presentation. And I know it's something that ARHE is still working to figure out how to combat. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, Sarah, I mean, that, that's, it's, you know, it needs to be said that uh, 
people of color underrepresented in these collegiate recovery programs. The data from Dr. Dr. Alexandra Laude did the first big research study on these are the universities, these are what the collegiate recovery programs are, these are who's participating in it, these are the demographics of such and the research. Um, obviously, we talk about the GPAs, but the, you know how what 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 ARHE and what or other what we can do to do more collaborations and partnerships to help our historically black colleges and, and other aspects. I mean, that's still that needs to be discussed. And um, the executive director, Tim Rabel, and, and the board of ARHE uh, wrote out an email kind of breaking down what they're looking to do and really just owning it, too. Um, so uh, we're looking forward to the conference next week. For those of you who would like to uh, check it out again it, on the uh, www.collegiarecovery.org. So um, that you can uh, sign up for it and it's uh, virtual. So hopefully I'm looking forward to seeing what's what's on the table for next week discussing this. Um, the age demographic from 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 us is, is around that age, same demographic that we're, we're looking at Sarah mentioned. Um, so again, uh, a lot more to be done to 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 to, uh, to support the inclusivity of collegiate recovery programs. Yeah, thanks for that. I also um... I'm wondering, and sorry if you I, you covered a lot, and I was kind of writing as you go, but I'm in you know recovery myself, of course, and um, I was very young when I stopped and got into recovery, and I just thought university was impossible, and that I'd done so much damage even at that point that there's no way. Uh, and luckily, you know, I, I did go to school and get that done. But what are there any like you know preconceived kind of you know ideas about barrier like what what people can't go to school or, or you know what prevents them from going or things um for instance i'm asking you know i had assumed for so long that if you had you know criminal charges that you couldn't get financing for school or that you know you wouldn't be admitted or you know are there any things like that that yeah you know? that's a really great question um so and again this is where you know I want to be careful with the answer because there's things change all the time. So historically, the, the thought process was if I got caught with drugs, I can't go to college, right? I can't, I can't, I can't or I can't get financial aid. And I remember bringing that up to, um, to I mean, to uh, to one of the gentlemen in the Office of National Drug Control Policy, and and he's like, that's not true. That's not, that's not, I mean, the law was, the law was, I mean, it was a, not a good law in general. Like, don't get me wrong, it needs to be fixed. But what was originally stated was, and again, I'm not a lawyer, so please don't take my word on this, but I need to relook at that statute. So, but one of the things that they mentioned was, um, what it said was, if you got caught with drugs or something of that sort, or caught with a certain, I don't know, amount or whatever it is, um, and you were on financial aid, you couldn't get financial aid again or something of that sort. So there needed to be clarity on that, right? No matter what, it, it sounded like it was still an issue, right? I mean, still like there need, where's the forgiveness? Where's the aspect of someone who's in recovery who is on financial aid? But, but it seemed like they were changing that and modifying that. I don't have the, but those are the kind of things that really we need to do on an advocacy part of uh, our federal partners to understand that people who are in recovery who've had those issues before should not be should not be withheld federal financial aid so i don't have the updated data on that so i don't want to quote what they did but they were working on that and i i um, so when someone goes through the FAFSA process, we really encourage them to, uh, there's an appeals form, there's a lot of different things that we're always happy to help them work through. Um, but those would be kind of examples. Another example is, uh, I can't get into college if I have a felony, I can't get into college if I have a, a uh, thing on my record. Well, I gotta tell you, I, I, Rutgers University, I love Rutgers. It's uh, one of the most incredible universities ever. Keith Murphy, who runs that program, and Lisa Lehman are the greatest people in the world. Um, anyway, they, I mean, you, I, the, the, the ability for them to be able to advocate for our students in recovery when they're applying to say, hey, listen, this person may have had this issue happen in the past, but look what they're doing now, right? Incredible. Um, what we have had challenges with, in, particularly in Florida, is um, when someone is on parole or someone has outstanding s sanctions that haven't been completed, sometimes the application can be held up until th they've completed their sanctions. So um, again, just going through this process and a lot of encouragement they need and a lot of advocacy to know, hey, listen, I'm rolling my sleeves and we're gonna, we're gonna make sure that school knows 
that you're not that same person, right? So, but you're right. There's there's a lot of hearsay out there. Did I answer that? You did. That was awesome. I was like, you know, because that's what I learned. And I when I and I said something out loud in a group, you know, a group of people about how, you know, it's a shame that these barriers exist. And someone was like, no, they don't, you know, and. Um, it's huge because we come into recovery and there's a lot of shame and there's a lot of regret and fear of judgment. And the, and, and the thing is, you know, there's still a lot of opportunity. Um, I got to say, every time I hear you all talk about the work you do, I'm impressed because I've attempted to engage with the universities in our region. And we have a lot here in the DC region. And, you know, GW is great for collegiate recovery. Um, you know, George Mason had, you know, something going and I, I don't know where they are right now, but a little more, you know, open to it. But to your point, and this is a statement, not a question, but to your point, um, there are so many moving pieces and it's so hard to find the right people to try and navigate the collegiate environment um, that is quite amazing all have accomplished so far and, and continue to accomplish and what the whole collegiate recovery movement's doing. Um, because this talk's a little different, we don't, we're not doing the CEUs. Um, we actually can do a little bit more talking about exactly what we're doing, almost not shameless plug, but really like, here's our services. And I'm wondering if you both want to talk, cause your, your partnership's really unique because Mark is completely separate from Karen and then, you know, Encore is a partnership between the two, but Mark has collegiate, you know, collegiate success, Karen collegiate success embedded in it. At, at Maryland Addiction Recovery Center. And then Jonathan, you do so much for Pennsylvania and Florida and everywhere. So do each one of you wanna take a little while and just talk about exactly the work you're doing and the services you're offering and how that plays out? Sure. Yeah, there. so Please. at Mark, um, we, I guess we have, Jonathan obviously started the College Success Program and um, Mark decided that we wanted to bring college success to Maryland Addiction Recovery. And so with that came Jonathan and his amazing resources. Um, I get to have twice weekly phone calls with Jonathan and he's kind of available at my beck and call whenever I need anything. <laughs> um, and what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is I identify patients upon admission who either say that they want to go back to school, they tell us, or I work with our clinical team to kind of flag people and decide and help them like figure out what they want for their academics. How can we work academics into your treatment plan? How can we work academics into your career goal? Um, sometimes that is meeting with people within the first week, you know, they have left in the middle of the semester and they have a lot of paperwork to do. It's not fun when they're coming in with like a trail of wreckage behind them. Um, so I meet with them early and often to make sure all of that paperwork is getting taken care of. Um, talking to their advisors, talking to the counseling staff a lot of the time, um, talking to their professors. And then once they've been here for a little bit longer, I start meeting with them once a week to identify what they want for their academics. You know, what do you want to major in? What, how can we figure out what you're passionate about? What are you excited about? Do you like math? Do you hate math? Do you like writing? Do you like science? What are your interests? Um, I do some Myers-Briggs testing with students and, um, I tried, I'm not formal Myers-Briggs testing. I'm not a psychologist, but um, helping them figure out what they want to do. When they get to the point where they've identified a school that they want to go to, I help walk them through that process. Um, at Mark, obviously, we have a lot of restrictions in terms of computer time and phone access. Um, so working with me, we kind of figure out what kind of computer access is appropriate, when can you be doing it, um, all of that. Um, I really, I love my students. They are, I really love coming into work every day. They can be a pain sometimes because 18 to 24 year olds in early recovery are difficult. Um, we have a lot of behavioral problems with our students, but I like fighting for them. Um, and helping them like get these things that they really care about. I have one young man right now who 
is on a Lee, he's on a year long deferral from a school in New York. Um, and he, with COVID, he got the opportunity to do a free summer program. Um, so we are finding a way to work that into his care. He's got PHP all day long and then Monday, Tuesday and Thursday afternoons, he's gonna stay back at the clinical office and take an engineering class. It's like a two credit intro engineering class to kind of get his feet wet before going into full university life. Um, so we're excited to have a lot of individualized stuff going on. Wow. Nathan? Yeah, wow, just making me smile as I think through this and I think about Tom when you and I and we were up in uh, DC at the Collegiate Recovery Conference in DC and how incredible it was and uh, you know, uh, you answer your question is kind of what, 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 you know, if you think about it, what I had always hoped was that it wouldn't be on the therapist, all on the therapist to do this, right? So at the most simplest level, like the therapists are doing this incredible clinical work, they're doing the family, there would be a separate structure, right? A separate department or whatever we call it from an organizational psychology standpoint, I guess. Um, there would be a different department. You would have just like a high school, you have a college counselor, a high school counselor that our job is to provide hope, guidance, direction with regard to school, college, career, that kind of stuff. Right. So when you talk about services, so what, so my, my, my hope and my, my vision, our vision was to be able to have that as part of the treatment process. Right. And it's involved recovery and, and this terminology that was coined really by Kensal State University and other incredible programs, recovery informed academic advising, supporting students while they're with us to determine, um, you know, best fit programs, best fit classes, all that stuff, right? While they're in treatment with the clinical team and identifying goals, career goals, educational goals. In some cases, students have, you know, it's incredible. You see a student that's realizing that they're majoring in this major because mom and dad wanted them to major in them when they really didn't want them to major and they just want them to be happy. I mean, just, it's that, you know, and so, um, so, so I think it's that, it's that, 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 that integration, you know, but I also think, you know, if you're talking about service lines, what I'm very proud of is our sober dorm program at Karen Renaissance and the idea behind that real quick was the idea that some, a patient wanted to be able to stay on campus at Karen Renaissance while they're going to school. They were nervous, scared. They had some time sober. There wasn't a collegiate recovery program at the two universities down here. FAU, Lynn University do not have on-campus recovery housing. Um, so what do you look at as far as offering that service? That's a step down. So we created a sober dorm program, which allows uh, some clinical services while someone's in school with a priority being the education. Um, this program was developed not to duplicate or compete against collegiate recovery programs. It was an idea of a semester or someone who's going to a school down here where there wasn't a collegiate recovery program. Um, but that's taken off to be a, a really, really comprehensive, robust program where people are able to be in a level of care and go to school, um, especially in a remote now that they're able to have some brick and mortar connection during this very difficult time. Um, and uh, in Pennsylvania, we've done incredible things with, uh, with some of the local schools and looking how to, uh, again, encourage students to look at what programs there are to support their on-campus support services. So really it's just an array of different different programs, but it's all about advocacy, connection, support, and um, really extending the, 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 the reach. So I hope that explained it. Yeah, that was great. And then one question uh, uh, did come in from our participants as well, and we're just about out of time. So really quickly, um, what would you suggest for treatment providers if there aren't any local schools, universities that offer a collegiate recovery program? I just saw that question and it just jumped at me. Uh, it's a great question. So let me tell you. So I came down here when I was down here, FAU did not have a collegiate recovery effort. And it's going back and forth. Florida Atlantic University is a local university. So um, so we reached out to the Dean of Students. Um, uh, that, you know, we were able to get meetings with them. They, they created a case manager at the university. Um, so reaching out to a Dean of Students office could work, reaching out to a counseling center. But the way to really, I think that I have found to be very, very helpful is in, in, a, in, a, in a good way is you identify a cohort of students. Like you, for instance, your local community college, you know five or six people that are going there that are sober, right? Perhaps. 
you, you encourage them with their support to really reach out to the university to really set up a collegiate recovery program. So you actually reach out to, you know, collegiate recovery programs are designating different spaces or different departments at a university. So if you have students that are already going there, encourage the students to reach out to their dean of students to really advocate for this service. Hope that answered that. Uh, that was great. And, you know, with that, we'll go ahead and start closing out our, our webinar for today. I want to thank you both for um, really jumping in and, and, you know, last minute coming together with something so, so cohesive and um, really setting us up for next week's presentation um, that Eric Quinlan, who's another, another partner in this region that we've all worked with, um, and Eric's going to kind of button up with this conversation and talk about innovative approaches to academic recovery support during COVID-19. And of course, he's working in the DC region um, in a you know, hands-on capacity here. Uh, also after that, we'll host Tara Handren, who's the regional vice president for Karen DC regional office. Um, and she's gonna talk about virtual AA meetings, what they were like, what happened and what they're like now. I love that title. Um, Registration for both of the, the upcoming webinars is available now uh, and all the way through mid-July, actually. Um, in the meantime, uh, for all of you attendees, you know, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you need anything from Encore, from Maryland Addiction Recovery Center, or from Karen Treatment Centers, of course, you can reach out to me at Encore, Mallory Schwartzman, Maryland Addiction Recovery Center, Jess Ayer, represents Karen in Maryland and James Flintja represents Karen for DC and Virginia. And we're always happy to uh, be of service and answer any questions you might have. So thanks again, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your week.